Thank you. Choir, outstanding. Thank you, Mark, for picking that song. And whoever the writer was, bless you. Bless you. Wasn't me, I know that, but I enjoyed it. Um, we begin uh, this month talking about vision. And most of the time when people talk about vision, they think of seeing things in the future. But really what our desire was, was to see things as they have been, and we will look to what God may be doing and bringing in the future, but our greatest desire is just to meet God in the right now, just to see God in the right now, because that's where the experiences occur, or in the right now. And God desires to meet us there. God desires to meet you right now. God desires to speak right now. So if you have your Bible right now, turn it to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll be looking in verse number 16. You'll stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. It's been a week, church. Been a week. I'm looking for God to do something amazing. By the way, I don't know that in the time that I've been here as your pastor, since March, that I've had as many people talk to me about what God has been doing in their life and what God spoke to them in the sermon last week. I promise you it had nothing to do with me. promise you that. But I am very grateful that you were listening to the Lord and that God did some work in your life this week. Uh, that's always encouraging to, to see the hand of God working with his people. Amen? Amen? In 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is the only time that you're going to see that word in all of Scripture. Inspiration. Literally, God breathed. Two words make up this one word, God and breathe. So literally he is saying all scripture is given as God breathed it. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the book of Revelation, in the 19th chapter, at the very uh, culmination of it, in the 11th verse, he said, I, and I saw, John the, the, the revelator said, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. That's Christ. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. There's only one who can judge righteously, and that's Christ. His eyes were like a flame of fire. He sees all. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew but he uh, except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, now I pray that you will add your blessing to your word. I pray, Lord, that uh, you will hide me, as the old preachers say, behind the cross. Lord, I mean that I don't want them to see me. I want them to see you. Lord, I want them to see the work of what you did for us, manifested on the cross, made alive today by the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Father, as you spoke to them, speak to us. Because when you speak, you speak truth, and you speak life. Lord, we call it inspiration because it is God-breathed, directly from your throne for us, for our benefit. And Lord, as I've said many times, for your glory and for your glory alone. So Lord, let, our, let us be attentive to you. Lord, may I not get in the way. May our minds not drift. But Lord, how blessed we would be if in the next few moments 
And the only way that I know is just to having a God moment, you would just draw us to yourself as children sitting at your feet. Lord, I know in heaven today we have loved ones, some recently arriving. And Lord, we're, they're grateful because they see your perfection. They see your righteousness, and Lord, they feel your love. But I pray by faith we can have the same experience today. So, Father, do a Christ work, a holy work in our midst today. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Jesus is the Word of God. John introduced him to that in his gospel in the very first verse. And John also, when meeting with Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, and he was taken by the Spirit into the places of glory where time would not exist, he looked to a day that was coming, and when he saw Christ then ready to come back to capture his church, to, to call an end to all of the things that had been tainted by sin, once again, he saw the white horse, he saw the righteous one on the horse, and he saw a name, only he knew the Word of God. Words are unique. This week I was riding by and I saw the sign up here. I, I like the signs at the schools, and I looked up at New Holland and it said, enjoy the summer. And then underneath it, it said, read, read, read. Well, you know, uh, first thing I thought, I'm a contrarian, so a little bit, maybe a little bit contrarian. A little bit. I thought, if it were me, I'd have said, read, add, and have a lot of fun. But then I thought, no, really, they said it right. What they wanted for their kids was to learn this summer. And we learn by reading. We learn something we don't know. We read those words, and life can come up. I remember as a how many of y'all remember C-Spot Run, Dick and Jane? Look at the hands all over the place. And, and we didn't really enjoy it as much back in the day, but life took on new meaning to us. And I remember the time we could go to the library and pick a book. Y'all remember that? And, and, and uh, Weekly Reader. Some of y'all remember Weekly Reader. I'm dating myself here. And, and it was always a joy because... We were so excited to get something and read something and learn something. Words are the expression of life. He described himself the expression of everything that is good and right is true and true. He expressed himself as the word. 2 Timothy 3:16 tells us that this word is the inspired, God-breathed Word of God. We say many times that it is the inspired, infallible, it cannot let you down, inerrant, no, no falsehoods in it, no errors in it. It cannot lead you astray. Whatever it says, it speaks truth. It's not a history book, but when he speaks about history, it speaks truth. It's not a science book, but when it speaks of science, it speaks truth. Whatever it is in every facet of life, it is the expression of not everything that God knows, but everything that God wants us to know. It's the expression of life. It is the expression of truth. God desired a relationship with us. And he spoke to us when Moses heard those words. The first one to pin things down. Do you think God had a plan by, by letting Moses be taken by an Egyptian woman and, and raised in Pharaoh's household where he could learn to read when, when, when the, the, the paper was first starting to come about and, and, and to where he could record things down? And Before that time, it was having to be given from one generation to the next, one family to the next by, by verbal words. But God met Moses, and, and, and for the 40 years, while they were camping in the wilderness because of their unbelief, 
because of the choices they made, God met with with Moses as a friend meets with a friend. The Bible says met with him face to face. And in that time, Moses began to pen some words, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. How do we know it's the word of God? Because God breathed it to them. It was more than Moses' words. Yes, it came through the pen of man, but it's the word of God. So then when Joshua and others, as we we go through all the prophets of the Old Testament, and we see uh, all those words, whether it's the poetic words of Solomon and David and and, and, uh, and the others, or or, or Isaiah and Jeremiah or Malachi, or getting to the New Testament where the disciples begin the Gospels, or Paul and his letters and the epistles that were there, they were all breathed, listen to me now, as the Holy Spirit, The Holy Spirit so spoke, so saturated, and so used them. God blessed them. God spoke to them. God spoke through them. And we're the one that's benefited by it. And then we think, well, that's what God did through them. Listen, God reveals his nature. As he did to Adam and Eve, he does to us. God spoke with Adam and Eve. God walked with Adam and Eve. God placed choices before them that Sheila spoke about. By the way, temptation, my goodness. How many of y'all thinking about cookies? (laughs) Evidently, I am. Amen? And and they chose not very well, did they? And there were consequences that came with their choices. And Adam and Eve had some boys. Y'all ever heard of Cain and Abel? And there were choices that were there. Listen to me now. Listen. As God spoke to Adam, as God spoke to Eve, God spoke to Cain, God spoke to Abel. Choices were made, some well, some not so well. God called them to himself. We were created for a relationship with Almighty God. We were created in the image of God. And all of us have an ear to hear The voice of God. You don't have to develop it. It's already there. Not any person that's ever been born was born without a capacity to hear the voice of God. Do you hear me? So God would come and speak directly to his people. Now, when we hear these words, and I said I was going to talk about divine inspiration, how many of you thought that meant like Paul or, or, or like Moses or like Isaiah? Poli, do you think that there's divine inspiration in you? He says yes. Judy says yes. How many of you are not, not so sure? See, we, we can see it in others. But God gave us an ear to hear. In the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3, he spoke to seven churches, seven letters that were written to seven churches. And he said this word to all of them. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. Now, it's the same word. So it was, the word was given. It's just some had an ear to hear. Some had an ear to hear that refused to listen. What would keep us from hearing God? Are you ready for this? Our pride and our ego literally just wanting our way. Thinking what we think, wanting what we want. Our ego keeps us there. But God says, I want you to see what I have for you. 
I want you to see the goodness that I've developed before you. God put a tapestry of his goodness to reveal his nature to us. Creation. All of God's nature. There's some beautiful things in this world. Those little children up there this morning, weren't they beautiful? Amen. All of them. Glorious. Love. How many of y'all are grateful for love? Grateful that you have been loved. How many of you are grateful that there is grace that means that you get loved whether you deserve it or not? And mercy that keeps us from getting what we really do deserve. The beauty of love and generosity and kindness. The beauty of family. And the beauty of forgiveness. God said, all these things are here, and I've given them to you. I want you to know they're love. I looked up, and the clock's wrong because it says four minutes till. My clock on my watch is wrong, too, because it says three minutes till. <laughs> Did I hear hurry up? <laughs> Well, bless God, I got a whole nother page of notes here if you want me to. <laughs> Let me tell you some quick things about God. I pray they're quick. Number one, God knows everything. God knows everything. God wants to reveal what's good and right and best for you. This is called the omniscience of God. It's really the omnipresence of God, too, because God knows all. He sees all. But because he's omnipresent, he knows yesterday, today, and tomorrow as if it's the same time. He's not held by the, the, this limit of time. He, it's kind of, I've, I've used this illustration many times. If you're watching a parade on the street, you can only see that which is in front of you. But if I took you to the top of the building looking down, you can see the beginning of the parade, you can see the middle of the parade, and you can see the end of the parade all at the same time. God sees yesterday, today, and forever all at the same time because he has the vantage point of sitting on the glory of God. The Bible tells us that before the foundation of the world, he knew that he would create us. He knew that we would choose sin. He knew that there would need to be forgiveness, and he planned the plan of salvation before he ever created Adam and Eve or this world at all. God knows everything. And God has a plan for you. Jeremiah, that, that scripture that we all know so well, Jeremiah 29. Let me re begin reading to you in verse 10. Jeremiah 29, 10. It says, for thus says the Lord. Now hold on, let me give you the background for this. The children of Israel were told to follow the word of God. They chose not to. They were warned over and over and over and over again. But they continued to choose not to be obedient to the Word of God. So God told Jeremiah, tell them, you're going to captivity. By the way, he told them, when you get there, build houses, plant gardens, you're going to be there 70 years. He said, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you. Perform my good and good word toward you. Did you hear that? My good word toward you. I've said it. I'll fulfill it. And cause you to return to this place. He told them before they left that he would bring them back. For I know the plans that I have for you. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. I have plans for you. God has plans for your life. Now, you may not choose to follow those plans, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan for good. I pray for the young people because the, the quicker they learn that, the better it is. I pray for the old people because so, some have wasted that experience, and the quicker that they learn that, the better their end will be. He says, then you will call upon me, 
and I will go and, and pray, and, and you will go and pray to me, and, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I will be found by you. He says, I'll be faithful. God has a plan for us. God has a plan for us. But you must choose God's plan. You can miss it. I don't know why God gave us the opportunity to say no. Parents, did you ever have to tell your children no? That was an amen moment. You said no because there was something else that was better. How many of your children ever had a fit because they didn't get what they wanted? And don't you act holy like you're the only one that didn't have a kid that had a fit. Amen? They come broke. Right? Amen. Amen. They had a plan, and it was written down, and God gave them an opportunity. They just didn't always obey it. You remember when the children of Israel crossed over the Red Sea and they got to the edge of the Promised Land? Mo Moses came up with that great plan. Send 12 spies in. Oh, that's going to work. So the 12 spies went in and they looked at it and came back and said, Great land! Wonderful! You won't believe the crops. It is amazing! Big cities, it's great. But there's a... Those cities are armed and there's giants over there. 12, us, 12 spies were sent in. Two said, It looks tough, but we believe God. We say go. Ten said, Eh-eh. Uh -uh. I don't think so. Did God give them a choice? Yep. Did they live with the consequences of their choice? Yep. Let me read a verse to you. This was Moses before he left. Moses says they're ready to cross back over into that land again. He said, I will call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life, that both of you and your descendants may live. God has a plan for us, and God tells us we must choose. Lastly, as we have this plan, he has a plan for your life, and you must choose. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. It's a great choir song, brother. When you don't understand it, bow the knee. Bow the knee. He promised, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Those circumstances may look difficult. Hebrews chapter 13 says this, For he himself has said, I will not leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me? Church, listen to me. God gave us an ability to hear him. God loves us. God put his beauty there before us. God has a plan for our life, but he's going to let you choose what you want. Sometimes in our life, we've chosen well. Sometimes our pride led us in the, the wrong way. I just want you to hear this, and, and, and really the next minute is probably as important as anything I've said all today. We need to learn to tune in to that voice because we need it every day. God speaks every day, every day. I've been working with a young man for a while, and, and, and he, he told me, he said, uh, uh, I just don't know if God loves me. I just don't know. I've never heard that call. He heard the call this week, and he gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Looked at me and said, Preacher, you got your quota. And I said, Oh, no. I got many more to go. Many more to go. How blessed our life would be if we could learn to hear. Sue Sosby is in the hospital today. It's always tough to have one of our family members, Richard Brown's in, in the hospital, just found out about that. Uh, Clinton told me that he went in the hospital last night. I'm not sure what day uh, Sue went in, whether it was Thursday or Friday. Thursday. I saw her yesterday morning in the hospital, and we were talking, and, and, and we got talking about everything, and food came up. Amen? 
it was me talking. So uh, we, uh, we, we were talking about food, and, and I, I mentioned, uh, I think actually Sue mentioned Pigeon Ford, and I said, we love to go to Pigeon Ford and the Apple Barn. And we talked about the little apple juleps that they have and apple fritters and apple butter. Can I get an amen? I, I should give the invitation right then, shouldn't I? <laughs> Sheila had cookies. I could have had apple fritters. We'd have had an altar full. But we were talking about going up there, and I said, Lynn, I always go up there in December. We like to finish our shopping out at all the stores up there so I can pay Tennessee sales tax. Real smart. And uh, she said, yes, we were up there, and we love going to Belk. And I said, I know the Belk up in Sevierville. And she said, you know, we were up there one time. Listen to me now. She said, we were up there one time, and we were going to go uh, to the Tanger Outlet and, and go by the Coach store. And she said, we just felt led. This was her words. We just felt led to go to Belk first. She said that it was at 3.30. She said they went on to Belk, and at 3.40, there was a man in front of the Coach store pulled out a gun, and began to shoot people. Three people were killed, and he turned the gun on himself and killed the gun on himself. Now, you can yell coincidence all you want to. God, who knew what was going to happen before it happened, said, Sue, why don't you go to Belk? Because if she had, at the time it was, if she had done what she was led to do before, she would have been right there, right in the middle of it probably in the parking lot. Now you want to say, well, well, what about those other people? Did God speak to them? I don't know if he spoke to them or not. Maybe there was others that he warned that didn't go. Maybe there were some that didn't uh, listen to the warning. I don't know. But I can tell you what Sue told me. She didn't know what she was talking about this morning. And I can tell you how I got saved. God was working in my life for months. As God was calling me to himself letting me know I had sin but letting me know of his love I will tell you in the days and the weeks but really the days leading up to it God was working on me in a powerful way and the day that I got saved my expression is this I felt like I was going to explode if I did not walk down that aisle listen to me and give my heart and life to Christ before that, I knew who Jesus was. I knew that he was the Son of God. I believed that he left heaven. I believed that he came to the earth. I believed that he died on the cross. I believed that he rose again. But God was calling me to a personal relationship with him. A personal relationship. That's what we need. Not a church covenant, but a church, a God belief. Divine inspiration. I can tell you the events that God led to up to that day where God put the right people at the right time to speak to me, to get me to that point. You think our God knows what he's doing? You think he's worried? Fear comes with, with worry that things are out of control when we serve the one who's always in control. What would it be like if we just begin to live our life talking to the Lord as if he, Melba, just like I'm talking to you? And developing that. One of my very, very favorite preachers has gone to be with the Lord. He spoke life into me. He was an evangelist. His name was Manly Beasley. Four times in his life, the doctors had given up on him and said, you're going to die. Three of those times, God raised him back up. He was in the hospital in Houston, Texas, and all the, all the big names from the Southern Baptist Convention flew in to be with Brother Manley and to cheer him up. And they were in, in his room, and they were cheering him up when this woman came walking in with a, a very common dress and she began to speak. And when she began to speak, it, it was like she would be talking to Brother Manley, and then she'd say, Lord, and she would just begin talking to the Lord, and then she'd turn around and start talking to Brother Manley, and then she'd start talking to the Lord again. And Brother Manley realized that this woman could not, she could not differentiate between talking to, to him and talking to the Lord. It was just as fresh. 
And he said something amazing happened. The cheering from those heroes of the Southern Baptist Convention stopped. And he said the presence of God came in that room. Her name was Corey Ten Boom. Reader's story of being in the Germany, the Second World War, the hiding place, living on danger's edge, but finding a God that was there at just the right moment, all the time. And then think about your circumstances, and yes, they're true. Those pains that you feel are real. Those circumstances of life are real. But the same God who spoke to Corey Tim Boone, who was the God of Billy Graham, who was the God of Manly Beasley, who was the God of Jonathan Edwards, that same God is the God of us. We all have an ear to hear. But how many times do we walk a whole day in our own pride and ego and miss it? When it needs to be developed. New Holland, my prayer is that God would give us ears to hear. So we can look at this community the way that he looks at it. So we can look at our own life and listen to him rather than listen to what the devil has to say about our life because he don't get a vote. Or family or friends, I don't care what they say. I serve a risen Savior. And I get the opportunity to walk with him, and I do care what he says. My desire is to have two words to define my life. Yes, sir. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, begin it today. Begin it right now. Speak to your children all over this building. Let them know that you love them. Let them know that you care. Let them know that you're real. Let them know that salvation is a choice. Lord, it wouldn't be love if you didn't allow them to say no. But I thank you that you loved us with an everlasting love. Now, Father, if there's anyone in this building today that does not know you as Savior and Lord, Lord, let them feel the call of God right now. Let them feel the Holy Spirit drawing them to yourself. And Lord, let them get away from their own ego and pride. And Lord, may they bow the knee not to anything or anyone, but Lord, may they bow it to you. Father, I pray for salvation today. We need it. Lord, I pray for the Christians that are in this place today that they would begin to listen with an ear to hear. And Father, may we set it very plain in our life right now that the two words that will define us is yes, sir. Yes, sir. Father, bless this invitation. Call us to yourself. May your will be done and only your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.